Growing up on the south coast of uh, New South Wales, on the mainland of Australia, kelp forests were really a large part of my upbringing. And I'd spend a lot of time on the beach or snorkeling, or fishing. In many ways, um, you know, I feel home when I'm in the water. Unfortunately, over the past half century, we've seen 95% declines in our giant kelp forests. And those losses are really attributed to climate change and especially ocean warming. In Southeast Australia, we're warming about three to four times faster than the global average. So in many ways, what's happening here is that we're a window into the future. The changes that we've already experienced over the last several decades are going to be felt elsewhere in the next few decades. So with the East Australian current, that brought its warm nutrient poor water south with it, but it also brought along hitchhikers with it, such as larvae. And that was the first way that the urchins got to Tasmania as that larvae was transported south on the current. As the water in Tasmania warmed up with climate change and increased activity of the EAC, it also meant that that urchin could now breed in Tasmania. Some of the work we're doing here that I'm involved in is we're looking at whether or not we can find individual families or strains of giant kelp that might be more slightly more adapted to warm water. We've gone out from the remaining 5% of giant kelp forest in Tassie, we brought them back here to the lab and we can test them and see whether or not some individuals are just naturally more tolerant of warm water. It's the same way that some humans are naturally taller than others, we're hunting for those giant kelp that are naturally more tolerant of warm water. And we hope that that'll give our restoration efforts and our plantings a little bit more of a fighting chance as our waters continue to warm in Tasmania. kelp forest restoration is really about kickstarting a natural cycle. It's not about me and my colleagues here going and planting individual kelp and hoping that we can achieve kind of conservation impacts at the scale of the Tasmanian coast. So when we plant the giant kelp for our restoration trials, we plant them and we settle them on various substrates and here we're actually testing various methods to find what's the most effective for restoration. And we planted them here both on gravel and also on thin string or twine. And that twine, for example, is wrapped around other kelp holdfasts, so the root-like structure of the aquonia, and that's how we planted the giant kelp here and also on the grub. The kelp we've planted are now naturally recruiting and naturally reproductive, and they're now actually producing their own juveniles onto the surrounding reef. So the kelp that we planted two years ago have now produced over 100 juvenile kelp in the immediate surrounding area. And that's really exciting because that's the real secret for restoration and the real kind of key to creating these stable little areas of giant kelp forest. I guess what I'd like people to know and to learn from about kelp forests is, you know, they really are a community and an ecosystem that suffers from being out of sight, out of mind. So if you're passionate about kelp forests, you know, spread that message, tell your friends and families, see whether or not you can get involved in some of those research and conservation activities and just learn more about these really, really important environments.